I wanted to, I, I, was, I, I, I did a PhD in geophysics at, at, at UBC. Uh, the big question in geophysics in the, in, the, in the 60s was, of course, plate tectonics and continental drift. Was it real? The geological evidence was almost overwhelmingly persuasive to the geologists, of course, but physicists like to see, see real numbers. So I was involved in the, researching the techniques of laser interferometry and, and laser ranging for, for, for regional tectonic studies. And uh, Jack Locke came to UBC and gave a talk on wrong base on interferometry. And uh, I, I realized immediately that this was a really good geophysical tool. This is what geophysicists should start paying attention to. Uh, I had no real opportunity to do that at the moment. But anyway, I, I, I gave a talk at the American Geophysical Union in, in San Francisco on my research with the lasers. And M Marshall Cohen had been invited from Caltech to come up and give AGU they, they have a Frontiers of Geophysics talk every year. Marshall was invited to give this talk on, on, on LBI. And, and uh, I was fascinated, as, as, again, by LBI, uh, as I was with Jack, Jack's talk. And so at the, at, I, made a, I made a decision that at the coffee break, I was going to go and buttonhole this guy and talk to him, right? I thought there'd be hundreds of geophysicists swarming around him to learn about it. Nobody, nobody. I was the only, he was standing all alone with a cup of coffee, and I was the only guy who went up. Of course, I just pestered him with questions about this and that and the next thing. I, you know, one of the ones I said, I remember him saying to me, I said, OK, how do you define the end of the baseline? Where is the end of the baseline? You've got a 1,000-ton you antenna. Where's the end of the baseline? And he said, oh, there is one. I don't know the answer, but I'll get back to you. So he got back to me and got back. I ended up doing a postdoc down at Caltech with that. So that's where I, 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 I I, I converted to the gospel of, of radio astronomy. I, I, I served an apprenticeship of, of sorts at, at, at Caltech. But anyway, I, I actually came eventually to get a job at York University in 1972, uh, York Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I, I, I went, immediately went down to the University of Toronto, met with Alan Yan, and, and I said I wanted to join the, the, the Canadian VLBI group, but I wanted to do it f from the perspective of planetary physics, geodesy, geophysics, polar motion, and so on. So, so, he, so he thought that would be a very useful addition. So I was kind of co-opted into, the, into this, uh, uh, this three network, this, the closure phase uh, network of observations that, that, that was going on at, at 10.6 at 10, uh, 10 gigs. Uh, but we, we, we got the data, we got the delay and delay rate data and use it for other purposes. Uh, of course, this was not a geophysical, uh, uh, can I use this thing? Sure. Yep. Not just, yep. What happened to it? Oh, no. Uh, you went forward. Oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, okay, so oh, you wanted to use I want to use a pointer, yeah. yeah. I want to use this thing. Okay, thank you, yeah, sir. Yeah. I'll move it back. Oh, Is that the right okay. one? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, sorry, where are we? There we go. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so the, the, first mo the first real movement in, in, in Canada to, to begin a, ge a, geo a geodetic, geophysical uh, LBI system was, was the decision by NRCAN, the Geodetic Survey of NRCAN, to close their, their photographic zenith to a telescope network uh, and, and to replace it with, they, they, the plan was to replace it with, with LBI technology. So basically a, a transportable geodetic station was going to be used and, and we began an experimental phase. Uh, involving Alan Yen, University of Toronto, and, and, and York, and, 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 and the, uh, particularly Dave Ford at Sussex Drive helped us out a lot. Uh, we first of all tried this business of phase stable long baseline interferometry, which I guess is to some extent an oxymoron, but we uh, tried to do the, we took the local oscillator tones and looped them back between the, through the Anic, sat, Anic B satellite in, in both directions. It was actually a three stage experiment. It involved NRL, Naval Research Lab. Uh, Bill Waltman and, and, uh, and, and Steve Knowles. Um, it actually, this was, we, got, we got several, we got some good demonstrations of this technique, but we didn't pursue it. We didn't, we didn't pursue it further after, after, experimental, after the experimental results. Um, it was too, it, was, it, it, wasn't a, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a technique that was going to help us out particularly. And, and that was the last correlation done. Uh, the Joe, uh, Joe, that was the last correlation done at the three station correlator on the Sussex Drive there, NRC. Uh, close the close the correlator there, and at that point we had no we had no capability in Canada to do, do LBI. Um, so the CGLBI program moved on to kind of had to bite the bullet at that point and develop a digital system. Uh, so we did this experimental one where we did uh, delay de geocentric delay and Doppler corrections on record. This was the uh, correlator was built at, at York, uh, and uh, and the. Uh, the record terminals were built at Alan Yin's lab in, in, in University of Toronto. <coughs> and we had many successful 
experiments between ARO and DRAO at L band. Oh, this was this thing. Um, but as a result of the, well, the, this well, this actually had, this, 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 this method had a lot of very serious drawbacks, and we didn't pursue it either. We came to the conclusion we needed, we needed to move forward to a 128 megabit per second system competitive with the Mark III for, for, for future geodetic work in Canada. So we began to, to plan that. Um, <clears throat> What happened in, the, in, in, in 1986, the, uh, the um, NASA Coastal Dynamics Program, J, JPL had been experimenting with, with mobile BLBI in, in, in California, mainly seismic risk assessment, monitoring fault motion, and so on. So they, could, they, could, they, had, these big, they had these big, humongous 50-foot trailers which contained a Mark III system, a hydrogen maser in an office, and all, all air-conditioned and everything. And, uh, and then, of course, the Haystack had built the Mark III recorder, the recorder and playback unit and correlator for high precision, high precision geodetic measurements. So they could make intercontinental, they could make baseline, intercontinental baseline measurements to a precision somewhere between one and two centimeters, let's say, say 10, 10 to 20 millimeters, in, in, as a vector component, all three components. Um, uh, so they, they came to Canada and did a lot of observations in Canada. It was, a, I say, a logistical two to force to see these big trucks. They came to ARO, they came to DRAO here, which <laughs> Gary and I were talking about yesterday. Uh, and they did some work about Yellowknife and the NRCAN seismic array up there. Uh, they left behind their nine meter antenna, which is now here, of course, uh, and, and at Whitehorse. Um, and, and NRCAN began serious investments in building up the capability in the ge geophysical side for LBI in Canada. And they, they purchased the one, the cooled SX receiver used in the NASA, NASA Custod Dynamics program. And a, and a NASA hydrogen maser was installed at Aero. Uh, and then uh, that was, at the, at, just after that happened, NRC uh, closed Aero. Uh, of course, the, ge the CGLBI program, of course, was, was in jeopardy. So NRCAN had to negotiate with the NRC for the continued use of the, of the antenna. Uh, for my part, the Ontario Centers of Excellence program was announced, and they were accepting applications for funding for research programs, and uh, it, it caused a stampede of applicants. There were 70 applicants for this thing, and, and, and only eight were funded. Uh, I, I put in a proposal to, build, to start the Space Genomics Lab on the campus of York University with the objective of building the uh, data record and playback systems, the S2 data record and playback systems, and NRCAN. So, we, so I, find, I signed an, oh, uh, I was funded, actually. Sorry, I've got to get the story straight. I got funding for five years, and I, I signed an MOU with, with, uh, with NRCAN to, to, to jointly get this program going. And they were going to design the frequency multiplex and data acquisition system. Um, so there's, that's an interior picture of the lab at York. That's, there's Bill Petrochenko sitting there. This is uh, Pierre Matthew is one of my students. These guys were all my students at one time or another. At this, at that, at this point, none of them were students of mine. But um, uh, as director of the lab, I had a very, I had, I took a keen interest in the in the in the, in the Russian radio astronaut mission. The reason being is it was a 128 megabit per second mission, and it had it had frequency channelization, two bit, which the which the design of the S2 we were making was perfectly matched. The Russians were not interested in the S2. They were going to they were going to do this with the Mark III, uh, but the the plan was they were going to have three large 70 meter antennas in the Soviet Union. This is the one. This is this this antenna existed at Fatoria on on the Black Sea. This is the 70 meter antenna at Usarisk, uh, which was used by S2. You know, that's another story. This one was never built. Uh, they were going to have tracking stations at both at all three of them, um, and they were going to have a. Uh, four, uh, five, four, four frequencies, 325, 1.6 gigs, 5 gigs, and 22 gigs, 350,000 kilometer Earth to space baseline. And this is a, this is a artist's impression of the, of the, uh, of the uh, spacecraft in orbit. Um, so the Mark III systems were, were, were not forthcoming. The, the Russian planners, were, they, they were beginning to move forward to, to, to building ground-based infrastructure for the tracking stations, and they could not get any Mark III systems into the Soviet Union. And they, they were getting a bit anxious, and they were looking for an alternative. So I, 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 I decided I'd go to Moscow to visit with Kardashev's group and uh, see what he had to say. I, I, I gave a presentation on the S2. At, at, in Moscow there. They were quite interested in it, but one of the things we actually, we promised we would do for them is we would put a Mark III f formatted data output, because they were planning a Mark III correlator. In the end, they did an S2 end-to-end, -end, and it's still S2, flying up there with S2. Anyway, um, 
of course, if they're going to do S2 for the record, and play, record systems, you need a correlator. Where's the correlator going to come from? So I, when I got back to Canada, I, I gave a presentation to the to Radio Astronomy Committee of CASCA. I was encouraged to continue in conversation with the Russians. Maybe there was some role for Canadians to participate in this interesting mission. And uh, then I, I, I met with, with Peter Dudney, uh, and I said, why don't we consider going forward with a proposal for a correlator and record systems and playback units and, and, and get the space agency. We go to the space agency funding. The Canadian Space Agency had just been established and they were kind of looking for things to do. Well, I don't, I'm not sure anyway. They, 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 they did fund our project anyway. So we did, we did go forward with a proposal like that. Peter and I went to Moscow later that year in December. And I remember walking around Red Square with him in this terrible snowstorm. Uh, but it was kind of an interesting place to be at that moment. And, um, and the, the, the Russians, to my amazement, really, really decided they were going to go with the S2. And so they made an announcement that, that, that this was, they, the, the radio astro mission was going to be S2. This was not good news for, for the Haystack MIT group who were hoping that they would use Mark 3s. But then Mark 3s, they couldn't get any Mark 3s. So what, what was going on? Well, it, it turned out we, ended, we, we find out we found out the end what was going on. But that, that's irrelevant to this, uh, this story. Anyway, they're going to go with the S2. And that was announced, uh, <coughs> they were, that was announced at the meeting. Uh, we went forward to the Canadian Space Agency funding. We, the proposal was, was, it was expanded to include the University of Calgary, Russ Taylor's group, for an LBI, a space LBI data analysis center. Um, and the Canadian Space Agency agreed to fund this project. Uh, I, f I had to deal with the, the, the question of export permits to, to, to the Soviet Union, because NATO, NATO had an export embargo on high technology to the Soviet Union. This, 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 this committee was called COCOM. And uh, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to get any surprises when we started to get this thing on a, on a, on a plane going to Moscow, and they, have to, they just throw it off, right? So anyway, I said, I've got to, I got to get a, an export permit. So I went ahead and, and approached the NATO committee. And again, I was successful. They, they, they said, that's fine. We, you can export your S2, mainly because I think it just looked like a bunch of VCRs, right? So um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Uh, so, so, um, so when we, so, so we, the proposal that went forward w between SGL and DRAO was to build a correlator. Of course, in our can, who also needed a correlator for their their project, they were they were just working on the data acquisition system. They said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll providing the correlator is designed to, to do geodetic VLBI, that is band, bandwidth synthesis, a uh, uh, group delayed bandwidth synthesis, uh, we'll commit some re resources to building the correlator again uh, as well. So that's when. The development project really came together after that. And it consisted of these three disparate, unrelated groups in Canada, the Space Geodynamics Lab at York, DRAO of HA, and, and Geodetic Survey Division of NRCAN. Uh, I, I can't, I don't have time. I, I want to tell you, I, I'd love to tell you about the S2 LBI system. It was a marvel, <clears throat> truly a marvel. It was, the best, it was the best damn system around at its time, bar none, bar none. Uh, this is the data acquisition system, 512 megabits per second. The nice thing, you could pick it up, put it on your arm, carry it out the door, and put it in the back seat of a car. This is not, you, you could do none of this with, with the Mark III. There was a, it was a rack, a six foot rack with, with, with tons of stuff in it. And um, this is the, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> wrong. This is the data re record playback system. Uh, the capabilities of the playback system were a superset of the capabilities of the record system. So you could actually, if you needed, if you needed an extra terminal out in the field record room, you could actually take it from your correlator, put it in the backseat of your car. And, and the, the Australians actually did do this. They actually did cannibalize the correlator on occasion when they needed another record system in the, in the field. Uh, it, it recorded at uh, 120 megabits per second rate, eight and a half hours. Um, and the, 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 the tapes were 10, it was, the recording rate was $10 an hour. You should, you should investigate, if you have an interest, what it costs to run the Mark III. This is the correlator at DRAO. Uh, it actually was a 10-station correlator, uh, but it had six uh, record uh, play, uh, playback systems installed only. Um, I, I, this, is the only, this is the only little technical detail I want to explain about the S2. There were, there was, there, it was a marvelous system, but this is how the thing did. Uh, wideband group delay measurements. It, it had a frequency agile local oscillator that could switch across about a gigahertz of RF with a switching time of 100 microseconds and a phase settling time within one degree of one millisecond. And it could switch as frequently as every 10 milliseconds. 
Now, now the, now the maximum delay on, on, for, in geodetic VLBI is 21 milliseconds on the Earth. That's the radius of the Earth, 21 milliseconds. So if you're going to switch 10 milliseconds, these things are not going to overlap. The data is not going to overlap at the correlator. So in fact, the S2 had a heritage imported from the S1, the, 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 group, the, uh, the system that had delay corrections on record and playback, that these guys were actually these guys were actually delayed slightly from station to station, so when they were correlated, they would overlap. But here's the, here's the data. This is, this is frequency across here, and this is time here. So the, 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 base, the, the baseband converter could switch from here to there to back and forth. And when it came from there to there, it was phase coherent with the previous time it occupied the system within a degree. And so you could do coherent integrations across here and across here. Now, Bill Petrochenko was the chief architect of this device. It was actually built at SGL. I mean, we actually built them at SGL. But uh, I recall a meeting in, in Japan where, the, uh, where Bill was giving a presentation on this, uh, on this design. And the Japanese were quite impressed by it. And I remember, I mean, it was Kawaguchi or somebody got up and said, that will be very hard. <laughs> and and, and that's, the, that's the polite, polite Japanese way of saying this is never going to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> But it worked. It worked. We got we got we got delay. We got uh, we got group delay. We got baseline. Uh, we got intercontinental baselines to, to 15, 20 millimeters, just like the just like the Mark III. We had the screen, We had the same roof, same value as a square root of, of BT, and and we had wider we had wider bandwidth baseband con converters. So the delay resolution, the, the sync function envelope of the of the delay ambiguities was much smaller, and the, these guys had to sort that out. Is it correct they would do it by hand at Haystack by hand? Well, it, it is a manual step. Manual step. Manual was, manual yeah, but there was no, it was just done automatically at, this, at the correlator at DRA. It was a marvel. It was a marvel. Uh, this is the transportable. Uh, so we, we learned a lesson from JPL when they drove in with their 50 foot tractor trailer rigs and their thing, and we were, we were going to do something. We, our data acquisition was going to be something you could put under your arm, and our, data, our, our antennas were going to be like this. Yes, thank you. OK. Um, proliferation of, of VLBI systems. Uh, this became a real problem in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the system because there were, USA had all these systems. We had this, and there was there were the, uh, all, these, all these networks were being produced, and they were using different ones. There was a, the KVN, a, a, a sad story about the KVN. Um, anyway, the G, GVWG was formed to say they would they're going to look into this problem and uh, the proliferate. The, the, the conclusion was it's, it's not a good idea to proliferate all these. VLBI systems, it creates interoperability problems. Uh, we didn't agree. We thought the inter interoperability problems were solved by the S2, which they were, in fact. Uh, and uh, basically, they, they thought that for the future, people should continue using the, the systems that were prevalent in the US and, and in Europe. So uh, the Australians announced that they were going to build the LBA with, uh, L with, with Mark III uh, VLBA. <clears throat> this is a Japanese Antarctic plate stability experiment. A lot of Australian stations. Japanese were very happy about that because they had a K3, which was a clone of the Mark III. And so this was all going to work very well when the, when the LBA was built. Uh, reality eventually asserted itself for the Australian LBA. Uh, the, the, these, they put the system over budget. The, the Mark III put the system over budget. They, they opted to use the KNS2. Uh, uh, we, we agreed to build them for them and as well for a correlator. There were a lot of consequences for the Japanese. So they had to get S2s into Japan and into the, cell, into the Antarctic. The Nippon Institute for Polar Research had to get into, the, into Antarctica, uh, which, which, so they approached us to, to, to provide S2s for them. The Chinese, of course, were interested in the fact that we were building a transportable geodetic LBI system because they were doing the same thing in China. So they approached us to, 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 to uh, about providing uh, uh, S2s for them, uh, which we did. And I got a call from CSIS as a result of that. So the guy, the, the guy phoned me out. What are you, he's talking on the phone. I'd like to come and meet with you, Professor Cannon. I said, certainly. Uh, I said, but I'm, I'm not planning to go to Ottawa. I said, why don't we do it over the phone? Oh, no, we can't do it over the phone. <laughs> so, oh, anyway, so, I, so I said, OK, you got to come to Toronto then. So he did. And then he just wanted to know what, what, what was LBI. I mean, it was, it, was, it was most innocent. He was quite happy for us to send these things to China. So he went away. Um, uh, yeah, can you? <coughs> Radio acid systems in Russia. The Gorbachev government collapses. The Soviet Union breaks up. Funding is delayed. The whole thing, the whole thing gets, gets into a real mess. And so CSA pulls out, and we, we, we put this effort into the VSOP mission instead. 
the Russians, however, do recover their effort, and, and they have built, they, true to their word, they were going to build it with an S2, S2, S2 system. So they, they, they then, for their 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 end end LBI testing, ground testing of the, the downlink and everything, they needed S2 systems. So they actually came to us and got a bunch of S2 systems. The Quasar network in, in Russia also wanted S2 systems, but this time we didn't. We, 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 they had something we wanted, and that was, a, that was their little transportable hydrogen maser. They had these CH75 transportable masers, and they were really, they were, they were this big, they were terrific. The, the specs of them were really very, very good. So we did a swap, just, just gave them, and we got, we got S2 systems, uh, 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 hydrogen masers back. Um, anyway, these were the S2s that were used in the VSOP. Not all of them were CSA. There's a CSA one, there's a CSA one. The rest were all provided by the observatories themselves, because they just, the S2 was, had become very popular. Uh, the, geodetic, the geodetic BLBI system also w ex got, got off the ground, and there was the, the, the Russians joined it, the, the, Rus the Americans joined it, the Chilean, a German-Chilean co uh, collaboration joined it, and then there was this interesting arrangement between, uh, between uh, Yellowknife and, and, and Gilmore Creek in Alaska, where you could swap the, the, the station back and forth. <coughs> Uh, so there were actually 15 countries that used the S2 system. I once tried to invest in, I, I once tried to estimate how many systems were actually out there. There's something like, like six, this is the data acquisition, the retort, report, record terminal, replayback. This is a tape to computer interface, and this is a VLBI interface adapter. This was very popular with JPL, with, with, with NASA. They put them at all their tracking stations. Okay, I'm going to quit. Uh, <laughs> this is a map of the world of where they ended up. Uh, there, not everything is here. There's, there's, there's Badari there. That's, that's, uh, Usarisk is, is here. And, and of course, in, uh, the uh, Antarctic is not on the station. This is the era of the VLBI wars. This is actually taken from uh, a book on uh, by, uh, the Japanese book on VLBI. Uh, this problem of the interoperability produced all this difficulty of, 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 of use of VLBI systems. And the, they call it the era of the VLBI wars. Now, they were actually frozen out. The S2, we won the war. See, this, 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 is, the, this is the Canadian S2 guy with a big hammer and, and March. And these are, this is the K3 and the K4 Japanese system. And these, the VLBA and the Mark IV are these Haystack MIT systems. They're, 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 de they're depicted as big fortified <laughs> temples of some sort. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the VLBI standard interface. Uh, in, the, in the end, in the end, they adopted they adopted the uh, S2 philosophy and interface specifications for a new inter interface standard. They, the GDV, GVWG finally recognized that, that we had done the thing right, so they, inter they convened this committee. Myself, Alan Whitney from Haystack, Tetsuro Kondo from CRL, and Dick Ferris from CSIRO to develop a new interface. Actually, this, this, this went on for about six months or more. It took quite a lot of work, but it, in the end, it came down to adopting the uh, radio acid was eventually launched on, in July. And I got this congratulatory email a few days ago from Carter Shelf's group. Uh, on September the 27th, in order to fulfill an election promise to cut $1 billion as soon as they took office, the conservative government ordered the cessation of a very long baseline interferometry system in Canada. They were given 30 days to shut down. DRAO, correlator DRAO, ARO, the transportable was out in Newfoundland doing sea level, sea level change experiments. Our international partners who had invested time and money in the thing because it was a good project uh, closed it all down. This was a shameful, this was a shameful uh, move on behalf of the, of, the, of the powers that be in the Canadian government. A world-leading Canadian scientific LBI program with many international partners, USA, Russia, Germany, and Chile, who had invested significant sums of money in the program, was terminated, apparently, for no other reason than political expediency. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Well, they, that that has that has led to the the establishment of the International Celestial Reference Frame, the ICRF, and the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, the ITRF, which which forms the which forms the, the global calibration network for all 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 satellite motion GPS is tied to that. 
uh, and 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 UT1 is is provided daily by by the by the LBI systems. They also they also make measurements on of, of all of the plate motions themselves. You can see the motion. You can see the motions on on um, on 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 in, month, monthly intervals. The interesting thing is. The interesting thing is, if you take the, the VLBI measurements of a plate tectonic motion, like take for example the the, width, the the rate at which the North Atlantic Ocean is opening, and you compare that to the, the geologically established, which the, the geological value established by seafloor spreading, the you know the magnetic striping of the seafloor. You aware of this? Uh, okay, so the, the Mid Atlantic Ridge is a, is a up, uprising convection zone, and and as these as these magmas come up, they they they, they they cool through their Curie temperature, and they get magnetized according to the Earth's magnetic field of the day. But the Earth's magnetic field actually has had gone through many, many, many reversals, which are well known. And so you can actually determine when those stripes were laid down across. And it's they're symmetric about the about the middle of the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and that gives you a rate at which the open the North Atlantic is opening. And the numbers agree. I was astounded by that. The the the, the linear rate, the, the geological data shows a very very smooth. It's like a conveyor belt that's just running and, and, and well uh, then spacecraft navigation the other thing the other thing it does is they, they do they, they navigate all the interplanetary probes with this with this stuff now because because they use differential VLBI between a, a quasar and the, and the telemetry in the spacecraft telemetry and it's a key it's a key uh, it's a key step in getting the the trajectory right so that the spacecraft goes to the, to the place it's supposed to be going to. That, that combined with ranging, that, which is not an LBI technique, but, but uh, anyway, I don't, I'm sorry, Jasper. That, there's lots. I could say much, many more things. <laughs> All right. Let's make way.